class. Thank you for joining this class. Today we will be looking at uh, chapter 12 and 13. That has to do with uh, wireless LAN concepts and configuration. Wireless LAN concepts and configuration. So at the end of the class, I'm going to give you the last assignment for for this course, and then I will let you know. And it has to do with configuration configuration of um, wireless uh, network. Now today we'll be looking at introduction to wireless and we'll describe the wireless LAN technology and standards. We'll be looking at components of wireless LAN and describe how the infrastructure is. We're also going to be looking at the wireless LAN operations and explain how wireless technology can uh, enable wireless LAN operations. We're going to be looking at this, uh, the tap warp operation and explain how the tap warp is to manage APs. Then we're going to be looking at channel management and describe how the different channels can relate to each other and communicate. Then wireless LAN threats and then how to secure wireless LAN. Now, wireless LAN is a type of wireless network that is commonly used in homes, offices, and campus environments. And wireless LAN makes mobility possible within the home and business environment. Wireless infrastructure adapts to rapidly changing needs and technology. And this is because of the, the, the change in technology where people are going mobile in everything. And the types of wireless LAN we have are the wireless personal area network, and in that case, it has low power and short range, usually between 20 to 30 feet. All right. And it's based on 802.15 standard. And usually it runs away a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. All right. Bluetooth and ZB are example of this wireless personal area network. So those of you who have Bluetooth on your phones, Bluetooth on your devices, that is an example. Then we have the wireless LAN, which is a medium-sized network up to 300 feet and is based on the 802.11 standard. It also runs on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency. So you see the difference between the two Bluetooth and then the, the, the wireless LAN, or most of the times we call them the Wi-Fi, is that the, the, the range it covers and then the frequency it can go. Then we have the wireless uh, metropolitan area network, and um, this takes large geographic areas such as city or district and uses specific license frequencies. So in this, maybe you want to set up a bridge in your network, you are setting up a network, extending your network within a metropolis, all right? And uh, this is where this comes in. Then we have the wireless wider area network that extends the geographical area for national and global communication and uses specific license frequency. So this also runs like bridges or where you use things like visa, all right? These VSA dishes and things like that to communicate very long uh, uh, distances, okay? So WiMAX, um, uh, which is a uh, worldwide international inter uh, operability for microwave access that is the WiMAX, and it is also an alternative broadband wired uh, internet connection. So you can use WiMAX or um, microwave access to have either for wireless metropolitan area network or for wireless wide area network. The, uh, the, the concept is that. It, it, it can go up to 50 kilometers, okay? It can, it can communicate between devices up to as far as uh, 50 kilometers. Then we have the cellular band, all right, which carries both voice and data and is used by phones, automobiles, tablets, and laptops, okay? So those of you who have like um, your mobile phones, you have your uh, carriers, you know, your mobile carriers where they give you the SIM card, you put it, and then your 
phone community, your SIM card community to get the, the, the uh, power. So that one is the cellular uh, broadband. Then you have the satellite broadband, which uses directional satellite which align with a satellite in the geostationary orbit. All right, and it needs a clear line of sight, typically used in rural locations where TV and DSL are unavailable. So, like the VSAT that we are talking about, or the satellite, what, what it does is that there is a satellite in the orbit, and so the device you mount has to point uh, the clear line of sight in a particular orbit, in a particular um, coordinate, in order to communicate with the satellite in the orbit. Now, all the devices that we use for wireless, they have certain standards, and it's the standards that we should take note. We have uh, 811, uh, that one is just um, 2.4 gigahertz and it has a small bandwidth of 200 meters. Then 811A carries 5 gigahertz, which takes 54. Uh, 11B has 2.4 gigahertz, that takes 11 Mbps. And then 11G, 2.4 gigahertz, that takes 54 Mbps. 11N takes both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and it takes 150 to 600 Mbps. Then 11 AC takes 5 gigahertz and it runs 450 Mbps to 1.3 gigahertz. Then 11 AX takes both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and um, it has the ability of 1 gigahertz to 7 gigahertz frequencies. Now, the concept of these frequencies that we're talking about is the higher the frequency, the shorter the distance, and then the higher the bandwidth capacity that it can take. Okay? And then, um, all wireless devices operate in a range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, the wireless run, uh, wireless run operate between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. All right? So, the 2.4 gigahertz runs B, G, N, and then A, X. And then 5 gigahertz run A, N, A, C, A, X. So when you are buying a wireless device, or when you are setting up a wireless device, you need to check the, the protocol, the, the, the standard that it offers. Okay? When you're doing maybe an access point, and then, or when you're doing a bridge, and things like that. So what are the components? The first one is the network interface card. And this is the card that you can use to communicate to the wireless access point, all right, or the wireless transceiver or receiver. So sometimes this network interface card comes in in uh, inbuilt in a laptop or in a device, or you can buy it extra. Then we also have home routers as uh, a, a wireless LAN component. The next one is the home router. The home router is simple, as you can see here. And most of the times you can just configure it to give you access point and it will be a VAT. Sometimes some of them come in the form of a small switch. So it has multiple ports behind here, you know, and then it has antenna able to give you a uh, wireless access point within a range of um, 300 uh, feet. Now, the point to note when you are putting in home routers um, or access points, home routers and access points, the, the points to note is. Um, there are signals that passes through glass, all right, wireless that passes through. But when you're putting it and the place is made of cement, decking, and stuff like that, or a lot of metal, you're not going to have good signal. So you have to place that into consideration. So what's the difference between the wireless router and, uh, and the access point? The difference is that wireless clients use their wireless need to discover nearby access points. So clients then attempt to associate uh, and authenticate with the AP. After being authenticated, wireless users have access to network resources. So what are we saying? Most access points are just access points, but most routers can do, um, what do we call it, DHCP, they can do DHCP, they can do, um, they can do routing, okay, meaning that you can set up different networks. Uh, you can also use the router to connect to your ISP. Your ISP can give you a link and then you have connection to your LAN. So, and sometimes you have multiple uh, LAN ports. So, that's like the differences. 
So whereas the access point, the AP is just um, just it's just uh, an antenna that helps you to connect to the network. Okay. Now, what are the categories? The first one is the autonomous category, which is a standalone device configured through a command line interface or GUI. Each autonomous AP acts independent. This is very important. It acts independently of the other configured and managed uh, APs, meaning that if I pick an access point and then I uh, and I configure it, I don't have one place by right here. I have an access point and I configure it. Um, uh, that access point is independent of any other access point. Okay, uh, just a second. Let me see. Okay, I have um, this kind of tool, but uh, let's see what it can do. All right, this is an example of an access point, uh, independent autonomous AP. So you see, uh, this is uh, what product? This is Huawei. This is Huawei products. Okay, and um, you see, this is how it looks. And then it has these ports. Can you see? It has these ports. And then these particular ports are the ports that we use like for, for LAN. So if I pick this particular, it has a, an external antenna, it can have external antenna, and it has an internal antenna. So if I pick this um, device, and in fact, this is also a SIM router, you know, it has a, where we have a SIM card, a plug in a SIM card. So this is an autonomous um, AP because. Once I configure it, I will assign an IP address to it. I will assign all that um, I need to assign. I will change the channel. I will manage it independently. It will have its own SSID. All right. The service set identifier that it will be broadcasting. All right. So, um, and it is independently managed. All right. Then you also have controller based AP, also known as lightweight APs. Uh, it uses lightweight access point protocol to communicate with a LAN controller. Okay, I think I have an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, let okay. so, this is this is an example of uh, a controller based um, AP. Can you see this one? Uh, this is the entire product. Um, I don't have the system one here, so this is a controller based AP, and if you look at it, it has only one one um, network interface card. And usually, you, this guy is managed using a controller. A controller, I have um, a cloud key here. You can set up using a cloud key, or you can use um, okay. This is uh, this is the cloud key uh, that I can use as a controller to manage this unifier. So you see, this is the cloud key, and um, yeah. So what what happens? What happens is uh, okay. This is how it looks. This is the app. What happens is that you configure use you configure this AP using a controller based software. Okay, so the software. The software actually is the guy that manages it, and for usually it comes with together. You can put in as many APs as possible, and uh, the software will be able to manage it. The software will be able to manage it effectively for you. So you see, the the, the autonomous AP uh, it does not roam roam as in. Um, it has its own SSID, so you have to, if you have like 20, you will have 20 SSIDs and you will configure it. But the controller base, you can have 1500, as many as possible, and they will be having the same SSID. And any settings that you, add, you make to the controller, it's going to be applied to all the, the APs. Now, sorry, let me, let me show you an example of um, the controller that I am uh, managing. Um, 
this uh, okay. the system is angry. Okay. Now this is an example of a controller. Controller B is the access point. Uh, let me go to let me pick um, the location. Let me pick the location. Let me pick the location for instance. So what the controller does is that um, it helps you to manage all the APs. You see these APs that they are down. These APs are down because the location that I am checking now, the location is down because there are no activities. But you see, these are some of the APs that are in those locations. So all the settings that I do on the controller is applied to is applied to these particular APs. Okay, so I can check the performance of the AP. I can check the not the clients that are connected to the APs. These are the clients. I think for this guy. This is let me pick this person and check oh, this person. Okay. So I can get the details, I can get the statistics that I want. I can come in here and then it will give me the statistics. So you see, all these are based on controller based access points. So anything that I do is directly on what I do on this uh, controller. It is it, it, it directly affects um uh the it directly affects the, the, the APs that are on that particular controller. Now we have types of antennas. We have the omnidirectional antenna, we have the directional antenna. Now from the word omni, it means it goes 360. So when you have an antenna like this or an antenna like this, all these are omnidirectional antennas. Okay, and they go 360 degrees. And then you have directional antennas. Usually they are focused radio signals in a specific direction, like this one. It's a directional antenna. Or when you have a sectorial. I don't have any here. I have to show you, but um, uh, like uh, uh, sectorial antennas, they are also uh, that. Now, wireless lab operation. Now, the wireless topology mode is the uh, ad hoc mode and is used to connect clients in peer to peer manner without an AP. What it means is that I can set up my laptop, as you can see here, I can configure my laptop to generate an ad hoc mode wireless to another laptop here. All I just need to do is enable the laptop here and check the SSID, then enable this one as well, and then connect to them but in this case you have to give them static IP addresses for them to connect unless you configure this your laptop to do the DHCP. But otherwise you have to do that. So that's the ad hoc mode. Then you have the infrastructure mode which is used to connect clients to a network where you have your router, you have the switches and that switch you have um, an AP access point whether controller base or autonomous connects to this switch and then it broadcasts the SSID for all the wireless devices to be able to connect to it. Okay. Then you have the tutoring. Now the tutoring is usually for your smartphones when you want to share the hotspot on your phone. So your phone has uh, the internet connection to your SIM card and then you generate the tutoring and then that is connected to your, your laptop or your devices. Okay. So those are like the different modes. Now what is BSS and ESS? BSS is basic service set, okay, and um, uh, it uses a single AP to interconnect all uh, all associated wireless clients. Okay, the basic service set uh, uh, uses single AP to interconnect all associated wireless clients. So clients in different BSS cannot communicate. Okay, they cannot communicate, and then you have the extended service set, which is the ESS. A union of two or more BSS interconnected by a wired distribution system. All right, clients in each BSS can uh, can communicate through the ESS. So, for instance, now 
you have um, uh, this router here and you can the SSID or the DSS, um, which is the name that uh, the router is broadcasting. Okay, you can call it, um, uh, let's say, staff or student or a hotspot or cafe hotspot, whatever name you want to give to describe your, your network. That's the DSS ID. So we are saying that all the devices that are connecting on the same DSS, that is on the same uh, router uh, access point, they can communicate with each other. Okay, so but the extended uh, service set is maybe you have a particular DSS differently here. Yeah? You have another one in another location, but they are all connected to, to a distribution device, maybe a switch or thereabout. So the devices can be able to connect. Yeah? So for wireless devices to communicate over a network, they must first associate with an AP or wireless router. Okay. So this is my wireless client. So this is my access point. All right. So uh, they must first of all. So how do they associate? First of all, there's what they call the discover AP or authenticate with the AP then associate with the AP. And first they use that using the DSS ID. All right. And so we see the DSS ID that is configured here. The laptop to see it and then to attempt to communicate to connect associate. So. If there is a password here, you have to put the password here to authenticate before the association is done. If there is no password, we'll talk about how to put the password, or maybe you have a radio server you connect to, you have to do that authentication before it allows you to do that. So, um, to achieve association, association, a wireless client and an AP must agree on specific parameters. Which is the SSID. The SSID is like the green SSID that we are talking about. Okay. The service set and the, the, the client needs to know the name of the network to connect. And then the password. If the password is set. This is required for the client to authenticate the AP. Then you have the network, the network mode, the standard that you use, then the security that you use, whether it is web or whether WP or WPA suit. All right. Um, and then you have the channel settings, which is the frequency band that you can use. Now, wireless clients connect to APs using a passive or an active scanning. All right, a passive or an active scanning process. We call it the program. All right, the passive mode if you only, uh, openly advertises its service by periodically sending broadcast details, frames containing the SSID, supported standards and security settings. Okay, so the AP that is uh, connect will set it up to be to broadcast its uh, uh, SSID so that devices can actually connect. The active mode wireless client must know the name of the SSID. The wireless client Initiates the process by broadcasting the code request to multiple applications. So, in this particular case, um, the SSID is like hidden. So, if, if you want to configure your laptop or your device to connect to the wireless, you have to know the exact um, SSID, the SSID that has been configured. Then, the wireless client is the one that is going to initiate. Can you see? It's going to remove the initiation to connect. All right. But in this particular passive mode, this particular access point is, is the one that is um, broadcasting. Tap and warp operation. Okay. Now, tap, tap warp is an IEEE standard protocol that enables the WLC to manage multiple APs and wireless LAN. Okay. So you have multiple APs and you want to. You want to manage them, so you need a controller, uh, controller to be able to manage it. So, uh, um, uh, based on the LWAPP, but adds additional security to the datagram transport layer. Okay, and it encapsulates the and forwards wireless LAN clients traffic between APs and the WLC over tunnels using 
the UDP tax. Okay, so um, it operates over both IP version four and IP version six. So the concept here is that we want to control multiple APs, like what I showed you about the controller base. You have one device that is able to to manage uh, all other APs uh, securely. And so um, once that particular AP is tied to this particular controller, um, it cannot be tied to any other controller except you release it or you use the security features that you have here. The tab work split map concept does all the functions normally performed by individual APs and distributes them between two functional uh, components, either the AP map functions or the WLC map function. All right, and what is the difference? In the AP map functions, the beacons and the code responses, and in the WLC map, um, it's authentication. All right, for the AP map functions, packet acknowledgement and the translation. The other is association and reassociation of roaming clients. Then we have train queuing and packet prioritization. Here we have train translation to other protocols. Then you have map layer and encryption to encryption. Here you have termination of HTTP 11 traffic and wired interface. All right. Now here, when you have the AP that is associated to the wireless LAN controller, uh, what happens is um, uh, it has to do it on a secure mode, and it does that using an encryption. All right, so it is enabled by default to secure the tapware control channel and encrypt all management and control traffic between the AP and the wireless LAN controller. All right, so it's uh, uh, just to make sure that the whole conversation is secure. So data encryption is disabled by default and requires a DPLS license to be installed in the wireless line control before it can be connected in the AP. Okay. Now Flex Connect APs. It enables the configuration and control of APs over a one link. One link that means the wider area network. And you have two modes that you can do that. The connected mode and the stand alone mode. Alright? You have your Flex AP here, Flex Connect here, you have your uh, WLC uh, here. Now, and they are in far locations, different locations. This might be in Angola, this might be in Nigeria, you never know. The head office might be in South Africa or in Angola. So, you are connecting this to over the internet. So, the connected mode, the WLC is reachable. Alright, that is the controller here. The Flex AP has the tap, uh, the tap warp connectivity with the WLC through the tap warp panel. The WLC performs all the tap warp functions. All right. So on the standalone, the WLC is reachable. All right. The Flex Connect has lost, uh, has lost tap warp connectivity with the WLC. The Flex Connect AP can resume can assume some of the WLC function such as switching clients and things like that. So the point is that uh, in the stand alone, like the, the autonomous AP we talked about, this guy can be managed on its own, but through the, uh, uh, it has to get through the internet or through the modem or whatever it is you're using. But on the connected mode, you don't have access to this guy. You only have access to this guy to control the services of this guy. Channel management. If the demand for a specific wireless channel is too high, the channel may become oversaturated, degrading the quality of communication. All right, we have different channels from one to, to level 12, I guess so. Uh, we are even more channels. For the three ones that are very common, we have channel one, we have channel six. And then you have channel 10 to 11, and not to all the time. Okay, those ones are three channels. So sometimes when your AP is connecting to a particular channel, and there are so many APs that are connected in that channel, they are saying that it is separated and will degrade the quality. So 
the channels are chosen can be mitigated using techniques that use the channel more efficiently. So the direct sequence spread spectrum, you prefer this, direct sequence spread spectrum, is one way that you can mitigate against this channel saturation. So and it's a modulation technique designed to spread a signal over a larger frequency band. It uses is used by capable eleven D devices to avoid interference from other devices. Then you have you have the frequency hopping spread spread spectrum that it process. All right, frequency hopping transmits radio signals by rapidly switching a carrier signal among many frequency channels. All right, so. Uh, the third one is the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, and a subset of frequency division multiplexing in which a single channel uses multiple subchannels and adjacent frequencies, and is used by a number of communication systems, including the OTT that eleven AV DM. So the OF DM is called now. Now this is the channel range that we see. So you have this one, this is channel 1, then there is this, then you have channel 6, this is this, then you have channel 11. So you see this, this one's in orange, these are the two ones. So you see there's no interference. But if you have your devices in channel 1 and in channel 2, or maybe channel 2 and channel 3, there's definitely going to be interferences amongst them. So when you, your system is picking channels, it has to pick the channels based on um, the this the free space. So you see you have channel one here is is exclusive from channel six and then exclusive from channel eleven. Okay. So best practice for 802.11 BGN uh in wireless uh, requiring multiple APs to use non-overlapping channels like channel one, six and eleven. Okay. Um Okay, so what we are saying here is that um, it's always best to use non-overlapping uh, channels. Now, when you are planning for wireless LAN deployment, the number of users supported by a wireless LAN depends on the graphical layout of the facility, and then the number of bodies and devices it can fit, and then the data rates the users expect and then the use of non-overlapping channel and that is why if you have so many APs deployed it's best to use um, a controller base so that um, it will be easy uh, to sort out those issues what are some of the wireless LAN threats? the wireless is open to anyone with a range of uh, AP and the appropriate credentials to associate to it Attacks can be generated by outsiders, uh, disgruntled employees, and even um, unintentionally by employees. All right, so wireless networks are specifically susceptible to several threats, including uh, interception of data, wireless uh, intruders, denial of service attacks, and then rogue agents. All right, so. Uh, DOS attacks, uh, wireless DOS attacks can be the result of improperly configured devices in malicious. In fact, just last week, um, I got a report uh, in one in one organization, one of their APs was involved in a DOS attack, and we just went to discover that this was one of the problems, improperly configured devices, and then a malicious user intentionally interfering with the wireless communication and then accidental interference. So to minimize the risk of a DOS attack due to improperly configured devices and malicious attack, having all devices keep password secure, keep backups and ensure that all configuration changes are incorporated of ours. Okay. So uh, you have rogue access point. The rogue AP is an AP or wireless router that has been connected to a public network without explicit authorization against the policy. So, like the 
like the network that I was showing you, uh, the controller that I showed you some minutes ago, um, um, I configured it to, to send me emails as the network administrator. So, um, like uh, this morning, I was trying to add the new access points to the controller, and then I got an email immediately. Okay, uh, let me see. If I can show you the email. So, once connected, the room AP can be used by an attacker to capture MAC addresses, capture data packets, gain access to network resources, or even launch a man in the middle attack. Okay, and that is why it's very important that we only put in authorized devices. So, a personal network hotspot could be used as a room AP. For example, a user with a secure network access. Uh, enables their authorized window host to become a Wi-Fi AP. So to prevent the installation of root APs, organization must configure wireless LAN controllers with root AP policies and use monitoring software to actively monitor the radio spectrum for unauthorized um, APs. Okay. Man in the middle attack or the MITM attack is positioned in between uh, two legitimate entities in order to read and modify the data that uh, passes between. So the two parties, the popular wireless man in the middle attack is called the human thing AP, where the attacker introduces a rogue AP and configures it to the same SSID as a legitimate AP. So you see users or clients around the devices will just immediately connect to it and then they will just be touching the MAC addresses and then the information there. So defeating the man in the middle attack begins with identifying legitimate devices on the wireless LAN. To do this, users must be authenticated. Mm -hmm. After all, of all the legitimate devices are known, the network can be monitored for abnormal devices or traffic. So how do you secure your wireless LAN? First is SSID clocking. So APs and some wireless routers allow SSID beacon frames to be disabled. So wireless clients must be manually configured with the SSID to connect to the network. Okay, that way you are securing. The second is MAC address filtering. An administrator can manually permit or deny clients client wireless access based on their physical MAC address so you can generate a database of MAC addresses and uh, to only authorize these devices okay um, the best way to secure wireless network is to use authentication and encryption system two types of authentication are introduced uh, the open system authentication and the shared key authentication the open system is a new password is required Typically used to provide free internet and public areas like airports, cafes, hotels. And then, uh, clients is responsible for providing security such as maybe PVP. But the shared authentication provides mechanisms such as um, wireless encryption protocol, wireless personal authentication, WPA2, uh, and free to authenticate and encrypt data between wireless access points and AP. However, the password must be shared between both parties to be able to connect. So what is the difference between this authentication method? The wireless encryption or wireless equivalent privacy, wired equivalent privacy, or wireless encryption protocol um, is, is good. The encryption method with a static key, but it's not recommended. All right, it can easily be tracked by very simple Hacking tools. Okay. Then the WPA, which is Wi Fi protected access, uh, is more secured than the web, um, but it uses um, the TKIP, right, which is the temporary key integrity protocol. That's the TKIP. We have two, we have TKIP, we have AES, right? So the WPA uses TKIP. Right, the WPA uses the AES, which is the Advanced Encryption Standard. All right, it's a bit more secure than the TKIP. All right, then the WPA3 is a new one recently built, 
and in the next generation of Wi-Fi security. So all Wi-Fi or WAP3 enabled devices use the latest security method and disallow outdated mega C protocols and require the use of protected management frames. Alright. So authenticating a home user. Alright, so you can you can use Fastener, the password to share key and you give the person, or you can use Enterprise where you are going to set up a radio server. Alright, the radio machine or radio server uh, that you're going to use to, to populate your users, right? So that you can um, authenticate them. And then the encryption, like we said, we have the TKIP, the temporary key protocol, and then the AES advanced encryption. Uh, standard. So this is even more secure. All right. So this is just like some steps to configure your wireless LAN. In fact, that's the assignment I'm going to give you guys. I'm going to send it to you guys, the packet tracer, and uh, what you guys will do. Okay. Now the WPA3 because WPA2 is no longer considered secure, WPA3 is recommended when available. Because a lot of devices now do not enable it, right? Because it's newly, it's newly in town. So uh, it has these features: uh, the personal, the enterprise, the open network, and the IoT onboarding. The personal is when we just use um, a particular password to authenticate. The, right, um, the enterprise is when when we use um, uh, like a uh, radio server or different kind of authentication. The open resist does not use any authentication. However, it uses opportunistic wireless encryption. Alright, to keep the traffic as the traffic um, communicates or as a sent. And then the IoT onboarding uses device provisioning protocol. Alright, the GPT. And this is very important because um we are going into a technology of um, Internet of Things. And you will have devices that you don't need to go and start putting passwords for them, like your camera, like your, um, your shoe, your car, and stuff like that. So, and that is it. So, that is the end of um, chapter 12 and 13. Um,